we have the second panel discussion for this morning. And um, to introduce myself again, I'm Hugh Wayne Fraser. Um, you can't get rid of me that easily. It's my, it seems to me because of it, my birthday, they wanted me to appear twice. <laughs> agribusiness investments in Sierra Leone. Um, here, of course, we'll be looking at the aspects of financing agriculture in Sierra Leone and what the challenges are, what the uh, successive or otherwise have been, and what types of financing, for example, are required in, 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 uh, in poor agriculture, what are the risks, etc. To start off, we have a couple of panelists. Um, Five in number, we are actually missing one, who is uh, Dr. Zappa Koma, the chief executive of um, Union Trust Bank. But of course, we still have a very strong uh, panel. And I'll ask them to introduce themselves and more especially what they do, uh, what companies of interest they represent. And I'll start on my immediate right with uh, Mr. Ralph Dillo Smith. Thank you very much, Quickly. Um, I thought before I actually say, introduce myself, I'd just say one quick uh, word or two from the investor perspective. I mean, this conference has been really great. We've heard a lot about uh, uh, the different needs, uh, but I think the one thing that's been missing has been the investor perspective. You know, a conversation always involves understanding two perspectives and trying to put yourself in the other person's shoes. And that, if you do that, then you get good dialogue. So, what is the investor looking for? There are two things that the investor typically utilizes to measure an investment. One is the multiple on invested capital, which means I invest one dollar, I get two dollars or three dollars back. And then two is the internal rate of return, and that is really defined more by the timing. When I make an investment, that I get a return in one year, five years, or ten years. Obviously, it's easier or better to get your return sooner rather than later. So the reason I start off with these two points is that most investors, when they're listening to somebody pitch to them, they have those two points in their mind. How can I make a multiple of my investment, and how long is it going to be before that, before that investment return occurs? And so these are points which I have not heard discussed so far in the day and a half we've been here. But if you're going to be talking to investors, it's critical to be able to answer those questions. Because an investor will either ask you directly or will expect that to come out of the conversation. So let me briefly just introduce myself and talk a little bit about my perspective. So my name is Ralph Taylor Smith. Uh, I'm based in the USA, uh, but I know Sarah very well. I uh, studied at the grammar school. Proudly with Antonio, and then after that I went off to the US and I went to a uh, university, a Princeton University and uh, Master's in Digital Technology, MIT. Um, so I've been working in the investment area now for 20 years. Uh, the first five years working with a major investment bank in New York, and then the last 15 years doing direct or principal investing as part of limited partnerships, which is how investments are typically done. And it's primarily been in terms of my investment experience in the US, in Europe, and in the Middle East. Uh, I know we have a number of folks from Japan here. Um, and a lot of the investments I've been involved with, uh, we typically work sometimes with Japanese companies, in particular um, NTT, in particular NTT Docomo, as well as uh, NTT Electronics. Uh, also a company called Yamatake, which is a part of the ASCO group. Uh, also another company called Fujikura, uh, Mitsui, Panasonic, and Mitsubishi. And typically the relationship with these Japanese companies tends to be as a co-investor. So they co-invest alongside us as part of an investment syndicate. Uh, typically they will set up some kind of strategic business relationship with the company that we invest in. And sometimes at the end, ultimately, they might acquire the company. So in the last six years, 
We've invested in companies that have been acquired by Yamataki, by Panasonic, and by Fujikura. All of these are more in the technology space, obviously, and obviously they're all more focused on the US. Um, but I think that gives you some sense that investment tends to be a, a, a practice where you invest alongside others. So I, although most of my experience has been in the US, I've done some things in Africa, primarily in Ghana, Sierra Leone, and uh, um, Kenya. I have to admit, I've had most success in Ghana. It's been more challenging to do stuff in Sierra Leone. We'll get into discussions later as to why that is. Um, so in the last couple of years, let's say two years, I've been working on trying to set up an investment fund for the Sierra Leone region. And so I've had discussions with folks at the IFC, folks at the CDC, ADB, so the usual alphabet soup. If you're not playing in this game, uh, you don't talk to the right people, we'll definitely be talking with one of those alphabet soup companies. Uh, but they're the ones who are involved, OPIC and others. Uh, the other group that tends to be an investor in regions such as this are high net worth individuals, family offices, and family endowments. So obviously you need to be talking to them. As well as emerging market fund of funds. So, very briefly, there are three perspectives I was here when I talked to these folks about working and investing in Africa. Number one is they want to have a credible investor team, a team that's done it before, that's made investments and has been with the investment through the life cycle. They don't want to invest in inexperienced teams. In particular, I've heard this message from IFC several times. So I live in Washington, DC. I've talked to folks at the IFC. They've made investments before in Africa, and some of them were not very successful in, I'm talking about some small and medium investor teams. Um, and the reason they think they were not so successful is because the investor teams were not experienced. Uh, second issue is they want to see strong deal flow. So they want to know that there are actually deals out there in these geographies. And third is they want to see local content. And by local content, specifically what I mean here is money raised locally. And maybe this is an American perspective, but Americans always talk about the concept of skin in the game. They want to know that there's money that's local, that's also going to be invested as well. It's sort of the idea that if you guys will help yourself, why should we help you? So typically, people look for at least 5 to 10 percent of the investment funds to come from the local areas. If they're raising, let's say, a $50 million fund, they want to see $5 million from the local area. And whether it's, you know, let's say, a government, whether it's NASIT, whether it's private, high net worth individuals, but they want to see local money. And it helps if you can leverage that money in a 10 to 1, sort of get 5 million, let's say, from the local region, and then 50 million from the outside. Those are the kind of things that help to facilitate developing a fund. So I have a lot more to discuss, but let me stop there. Um, let me just say that I've started to look hard at developing a fund, and one of the things that, uh, in terms of developing local deals is working with local entrepreneurs. And so I'm going to hand you over to uh, Greg Cole, who has done a great job working and developing uh, business ideas in specific sectors where he has background, has a lot of experience, and they will be relevant to the geography in, in question here. So let me stop here. Let's imagine we wake up tomorrow morning and a hundred thousand houses appear. What happens then? What do we do? How do we get people into those homes? So, without increasing access to mortgage finance, building houses doesn't help. I say this because the African Mortgage Development Corporation has two parts to it. The mortgage piece and the development piece. I'm here for the development piece because that is aligned with agribusiness. But before I get to the development piece, let me mention a little bit about the mortgage piece. We are developing a mortgage origination platform that is the centerpiece of an integrated housing finance mechanism to provide mortgages to home buyers in newly built off-grid communities. That is important because to minimize collateral risk, we will not be lending on existing properties. Off-grid is simply, if you're going to provide mortgages to home buyers, many get water, many get that. So the houses will be solar powered, 
have water access, and also wastewater management facilities. Now that's on the mortgage part. We are using alternative credit risk methods to standardize credit risk. This is very important for the replication and the scaling of the product. And I can get to that later. But the development piece is our pilot, which we're looking uh, to do in Sierra Leone, is a 500 unit uh, single family homes, as I said, solar powered, uh, and the community will have water and water access. But the key thing is that the construction of these houses will be, um, the house will be built using the waste from rice straw. Now, when farmers harvest the rice, the straw that is available is waste material for them. They usually burn it. What we do is we will take that straw and create what you call compressed agricultural fiber panels, calf panels. These panels have structural materials for housing construction that's really amazing. Fire resistant, water resistant, pest, uh, mold resistant, termite resistant. We will be purchasing the straw from the farmers, which will give the farmers additional income. Now, our goal is to set up a factory uh, here in Sierra Leone that will be able to produce these calf panels. These calf panels will be able to develop affordable housing units and also have an impact in the rapidity of construction because you have to be able to build these houses uh, pretty quickly. So when you add the mortgage piece and the development piece, that's what creates this integrated system that uh, we're doing. So that's my connection. I'm on mortgage uh, banking, but I was, you know, I'm here partly because of the, uh, the agribusiness uh, aspect of the housing construction. And, um, that's it. and we can talk about that if there are any questions about the technology. The IFC is the private sector investment arm of the World Bank Group, and our focus here in Syria is uh, the financial sector, the manufacturing, agri, agri business, and the um, service sector. We also focus on infrastructure, which is ports, roads, um, power, and mining sector. Um, in Syria, we have an investment portfolio of over 70 million. Um, scattered in those particular sectors. Um, we have investments in telecoms, we have investments in trade lines with the uh, commercial banks, and we have investments in tourism sector, for instance, hotels. Um, we also have an advisory portfolio, and here is where we give capacity building and support, technical support, to our stakeholders. Um, and in, in that we've worked with, we have an access to finance um, advisory program, where we worked with the central bank, uh, the Bank of Syria, and we've developed the collateral registry for movable assets. Um, this provides um, a platform for SMEs um, to be able to provide movable assets uh, opposed to the, um, the, the usual land and um, land and building that SMEs struggle to present uh, commercial banks to access finance. Um, we're also working with um, microfinance institutions to um, on you know to, to introduce um, finance leasing and if you see all the kekes around town this is our introduction um, finance leasing programs um, projects with the microfinance institutions and uh, it, it's taken off we, we're, we're working with three microfinance institutions in this area and we're looking at scaling this up and also working on the, the legal framework of the finance leasing um, um, program. We have programs for access to market, and for access to market, we completed an SME business linkages program, which worked with 120 SMEs across the country. Um, these SMEs were trained, it was a post Ebola program with the World Bank, and here we, we build the capacity of SMEs. Uh, we, we also uh, brought them together in a room 
uh, to which we call the Supply Symposium. So we brought these SMEs at the end of the training program in a room uh, to meet the large um, corporates um, that they, they usually or would wish to, to, to work um, in a linkage with. Um, so we, we developed a platform, we also engaged with the local um, agency, um, content agency after that to try and develop a platform um, wherein these SMEs would register and the, the large corporates would have access to know what SMEs were um, available to supply the products or, or goods and services that they require. We also have our governance program uh, and with that we work with the Corporate Affairs Commission. Uh, we've developed an online platform for business registration, which I believe attributed to our doing business indicator, uh, starting a business. Um, and also with the Corporate Governance, uh, Corporate Affairs Commission, we have worked on uh, developing the Syrian Corporate Governance Code. Uh, this is drafted and finalized, and I believe we're just waiting to have it officially launched. Uh, and uh, just to uh, mention another program we have is the health in the health sector. Uh, we have a public-private uh, partnership with the Ministry of Finance. Uh, it's also a project that came out of the uh, Ebola crisis. Uh, the lack of labs uh, led to um, affected the Ebola crisis response, and as a result, we developed a program out of this. Uh, and we're looking at developing labs in various parts of the country. And um, uh, this program is still um, sort of an implementation stage, but we have located um, uh, various areas across the country: in Freetown, Bo, Kenema, Makini, Potloko in which we would establish these labs and uh, work in bringing a private operator who would work with the Ministry of Mind, um, a Ministry of uh, Health there. Yeah. Uh, this is just to introduce um, some of our programs in both our investment portfolio and other advisory portfolio. As we go along, I mean, the panel is about agri-business financing, so I uh, will discuss what our challenges have been as an um, investment bank, as an IFC's mandate. Um, in Syria, and also what we see the opportunities or where we see opportunities in terms of investing in Syria and particularly in the agribusiness space. I'll just... Thank you. Uh, my name is Ram Shantidas. Uh, briefly about myself, my background, I studied in the UK at Bristol University for my undergraduate, and my postgraduate was at London School of Economics. Uh, before uh, moving to Sierra Leone, I was working primarily in the management consulting sector, focused on the financial, uh, financial services sector, and then in the FMCG sector in supply chain management. Uh, a bit about our company and what brings me to Sierra Leone. Shankaras was founded by my great-grandfather, who moved to Sierra Leone around 100 years ago, um, and the company was founded in 1939. Um, over the years, we've seen the ups and downs of the country, we've been through quite a lot. Um, now, currently, our portfolio primarily consists of in, in the manufacturing sector. Beverages primarily, uh, plastics, cosmetics, uh, and mattresses and probiotics. We are in the agricultural sector as well. We do have our own farms, uh, focused on different aspects of agriculture and different opportunities within it. Within the agricultural space as well, we recently partnered with an American charity to set up a cooperative. I don't like to use the word cooperative because it's a buzzword, it's quite ambiguous, but we set up something like a cooperative of about 100 farmers in Lundsar to try and expand on that base of agricultural activities. Um, one of the key aspects of our company is our focus is very international. We are a fully ISO certified company, ISO 22000 for food and beverage production, ISO 14001 for the environment, ISO 18001 for the health and safety of our employees, ISO 17,025 for our labs. Uh, last year and this year, last year at the ECOWAS Quality Awards, and this year at the ECOQAF in uh, Dakar, we were selected as one of the top companies in the region, in West Africa, for quality and environmental protection. So we take this as pride. Um, we are now exporting our products around the region, our bigger dreams, of course, and uh, we'd like to improve and show that Sierra Leone products, whether in the agricultural space or the value addition of agricultural products, uh, has a lot of potential and really has the ability to take the region and the world by storm, with the correct investment and the enabling environment in place. Uh, more specifically about the agriculture, 
uh, one sector of one aspect of our beverage line is the natural beverages. So we grow our own uh, plants and we process them into beverages or cosmetics and things like that. So we aim and tend to do the value addition in Sierra Leone itself. We are also focusing some aspects of our agriculture on the export of fresh produce. Um, again, another area. We're quite new in that space, but we see a lot of potential, and um, as the discussion goes on, I hope we'll be able to say more. You uh, returned back to Sierra Leone in 2012. Uh, I'm a very proud of woman. I uh, happened into agriculture. I am not from an agricultural background, but I happened into agriculture because I saw a potential to make money, and I am not afraid or ashamed to say I'm in this business to make money. I am involved in the cultivation, the processing, the packaging of both Moringa and cassava products. I started with funds, my own personal funds in my kitchen. I um, entered the business number competition, which I won in 2011, won 75 million euros, and this was a seed capital for me to start my business. And um, with this, and um, I suppose with the good um, corporate governance that uh, we uh, showed to investors, we were able to get um, funding uh, from IFC Coded, which is being administered by West Africa Venture Fund in Serbia. Um, we see ourselves in the wellness industry, and I, I see a synergy between my business and my profession. Um, we have a mixed partner, which is good. Um, from Eva and, I think, and Ram, to some extent, we have as we premier so entrepreneurs, business people, and uh, Dima, Frederick, and Ralph are more on the financing or investor aspect, especially financing aspect. So what I want to ask, especially given that um, access to finance, not just for agriculture, but especially for agriculture, in Sierra Leone is extremely limited in terms of the financial instruments, um, the avenues, etc. Uh, very limited. Um, so people like Eva and her business face a very hard time getting financing, especially locally. So I guess what I want the panelists to talk about, and I'll probably start right down from the, my extreme right, from the entrepreneurial the businesses. What is the gap? What, what uh, are the constraints that they find in accessing uh, finance for investment into, into their businesses? And on my nearer right, from the point of view of yeah. the financiers, like Bradley and Ralph and Jima, <coughs> what, what is dividing, what is keeping you and the businesses apart? How, and how can you, uh, that gap be narrowed? I'll start with Jima, please. One of the things that I found, that, and I still find, is um, that as soon as you mention agriculture, you get a blank look from our local um, um, finance industry. Because they will tell you that um, you know it's, it's not an industry that they have an appetite to work with because of the risks, what if your crops fail, etc., etc. So then I say to them, well, don't look at it as an agriculture business, look at it as an agri-industry. Because this is what I find they fail to realize. That there's a whole spectrum. This has been mentioned um, for the um, one and a half days we've been here. So what I often say to folks who are starting out, you have to start with your own funds. Your own funds from relatives, from friends, from whoever. You have to show that um, you mean what you say. You have to, they want to see you putting your money where your mouth is. I was lucky in that, um, like I said, I won this business bomber competition. And 75 million euros in 2011 was a good amount of money. And with that 
that I was able to scale up my business so that when I approached um, IFC CodeAid and um, presented a, a business plan, they were able, thank God, to see my vision. Others have not been so lucky. So it's, it's, it's basically having the finance industry having faith, not, not blind faith, looking into the business, looking at what you're talking about. Um, then of course, once you are able, or if you are able to get into, um, you're able to get funds from the finance industry. It's been mentioned, the interest rates is just astronomical. Who wants to pay 35%? So that's another thing, 30, 35%, I'm telling you. And then the other thing you come to is that um, there's this one size fits all when it comes to giving money to the agriculture business. They expect you to have a five year turnaround period. Now, if you're dealing with growing your crops from seed and comparing yourself to somebody who's manufacturing, I don't know, water, for example, you cannot compare the two. It's not like with like. So this one size fits all really is a big problem that folks are having in, in, in getting access to finance. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Eva. I'd like to again reiterate many of the points she has made. Um, and whether you're in the small scale businesses or even the large scale businesses, the problems are actually quite similar. I think one of the key of these that she mentioned was this one size fits all financial services or products model. Um, what the agricultural sector needs and has increasingly been getting, let's say, in Asia or other countries on the African continent, is more tailored services. Um, what that means is banking institutions, and I will discuss their challenges in doing this and briefly, but what we need is the banking institutions to provide services that are tailored to agriculture. If you're growing pineapples or coconuts, a five year turnaround here is just not feasible. Now what this often has to entail, and I believe Standard Chartered Bank has been doing this around Africa, is you need a technical base within the bank itself who understand the processes, who understand the business model in agriculture. And it has two effects. Number one, it allows you to invest and mitigate the risk. You can select models that suit the industry quite well, and you can understand and manage the risk accordingly. Now number two, these technical services can also catalyze your clients. You can provide services, you can provide advice, you can do certain things, provide products such as leasing, such as factoring, um, which can alleviate certain business issues that really are the nitty gritty of business. Factoring is a key aspect, a key element in Eastern Africa, which is very important in working capital. Farmers need working capital and in certain constraints, at points of non harvest, times like that. Factoring is a very key banking service. Um, so things like that need to be worked on. Now, I wouldn't, uh, I'm not meaning to um, challenge the banks on this, all I need to say is. It has to come with an enabling environment. One thing that has come across yesterday and today is that the entire value chain, the entire industry, has to be holistically addressed. Now, the banks will find it difficult to mitigate this risk and provide agricultural or services tailored to the agricultural industry without the enabling environment in place. Now, if land tenure laws are limited, um, and in many African countries, especially outside the capitals, it's very difficult to uh, manage your risk based on assets, land assets. Um, it's very difficult to follow the legal justice system if someone defaults. So these things do have to play a part and have to be holistically addressed. Um, so that the banks have the confidence to take the risk. Uh, and on the second hand, if that risk fails, which it never do, sometimes it does. You see, the problem isn't risk, the problem is more having to manage and take advantage of that risk. A lot of people in the banking sector will say risk is money. Now what you need to do is have a system whereby you can minimize the negative impact of, of that risk. Um, and as I say, it's a holistic thing. Now specifically from the product, from the processing side and the agricultural side, there are, other, there are other problems. Now if you are in, let's say, value addition, one of the key issues that we will face 
in agriculture, especially if you're financing it yourself or through a bank, is you're heavily reliant on uh, a very volatile supply chain. If you're in plastics, let's say you're in plastics processing, you're going to get your plastics raw material eventually. If it comes one or two late because of one or two weeks late because of delays in the ports or something, fair enough. But in the agricultural value addition, you're faced with a scenario where it's very volatile. Uh, what that means is many industries all around the world, and there are some in Sierra Leone also, are at risk of setting up what you call white elephants, a huge processing facility, and eventually there's hold up on their value chain because the supply chain A, a is either not able to cope or B has seen the opportunity to take advantage because the regulatory or uh, framework around the industry is not strong enough to deal with that and support the investors. So I think that is a big uh, factor when it comes to value addition aspects. When it comes to agricultural in its raw form, that is growing vegetables, growing fruits, either on a large scale or as farmers, financing again has its issues. Um, there is a lot of potential, but without the enabling environment in place, farmers, are, even at a small level, are not able to tap into their full potential. They, are, they have a lot of opportunity, they know there's demand for a product, but without the actual working capital in place, they cannot make the profit. People in business think about profit as a big thing, but without working capital, you're limiting your ability to gain that profit. Now, microfinancing and things like that are helping in that respect, but it's an area which does, in my opinion, need a lot of um, work. Now, we have tried to mitigate that to a certain extent by starting this cooperative model, where we support these farmers and provide them with the tools, um, that is, the financing and things like that, and with the support of this charity, uh, Just Cope International, they provide the technical expertise and other elements. And in doing so, we provide the number one, the ability to achieve that, those assets and that inventory and that finished product. On the other hand, we can guarantee them a market so that they know that they can happily grow something and will not be left with a full harvest and nothing to sell and a worry of how to feed their families. So on different levels, I mean, you need to consider financing can be a challenge, but you have to look at it on different levels. Number one, on the large and small scale, Number two, the challenges of the financiers and the enabling environment deficits, let's say. And on the other hand, how can you catalyze or maximize the value that farmers can bring to the economy and also, of course, to their families? So I think all of these things will come up as we continue to discuss, but I will uh, leave it at there at this stage. Thank you, Ram. Uh, just before Tina takes over, if I might just uh, ask all of us to be brief, we have limited time and we also want to the audience a chance to ask questions or give comments. Thank you. Okay, so from um, the opposite side of uh, what Brian was just talking about, as the perspective from a financier, I have seen Syria. One of our main challenges has been the size of uh, investments. Now, we usually, the proposals we usually receive from the agribusinesses fall short of the IFC's threshold. Now, the IFC threshold is usually five million, the minimum. Um, and we're receiving uh, proposals, so usually around a million, sometimes less than a million. We cannot take this to our credit team because the usual IFC investment cost is minimum a million. So if you, you, you have a proposal that's a million or less, it's not attractive to our credit team. So what we've done to bridge that gap um, in recent years is the establishment of the West African Venture Fund which um, Dr. Roberts just talked about. This, is, uh, this was an 18 million, I say was because it's fully invested now. Um, this was an 18 million in, uh, fund that was established by IFC, four million of which came from 48. Um, it was established in 2010, uh, and the idea was to look at um, investing in cash positive SMEs that had the potential to scale up um, um, in, in the years. Um, and the average investment here was between $100,000 and $500,000. In Syria, um, we did 12 companies. Um, the fund was for both Syria and Liberia. And in Liberia, the 13, country, um, 13 companies that were invested. Um, the sectors we invested in were in manufacturing, um, agribusiness, services, transport. Of course, agribusiness being taking a large chunk of the investment portfolio. Um, I would say um, currently where we are, um, we have a portfolio where over 50% of our investment um, are, 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 are operationally, are, are still operational, 
which in itself is a success in Sierra Leone, um, given the difficult business environment, uh, given the Ebola crisis, which hampered a lot of businesses, and, and of course the, the actual natural operational challenges uh, for businesses in Sierra Leone. Uh, I believe um, Dr. Roberts' um, company is one of, I mean, one of our success stories as well. And um, so this is um, one way we've been addressing uh, the challenges of uh, meeting the needs of agribusinesses that all short of what we usually would invest in. We're currently looking at also the local currency facility. Now, local currency facility is uh, one of four facilities under the World Bank Group's private sector window. It's a 2.5 billion uh, fund. And also, um, another positive side of this um, assessment would be the potential to develop the domestic capital market. So these are some of our ways we're looking to address our challenges, uh, which is you know, receiving smaller proposals and, and, and how we can do more in Syria. Uh, thank you, Jima. Sorry, if I could just ready and run. We have five minutes each. Sorry to consume it. Because I want to throw the uh, so, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, my experience is not uh, so much in agribusiness financing, uh, but in mortgage uh, financing. Uh, however, underlying principles of uh, with underwriting is pretty much the same. It may come in different variations and different combinations. But in mortgage financing, for example, there are three buckets that an underwriter will look at. One is your ability to pay. Now, that could come uh, both in residential financing, looking at your personal income. Right? If I'm making a loan to you, how are you going to pay me back? Uh, in commercial financing, it's more the asset. Right? Uh, does the asset generate enough cash flow to pay back my loan? Uh, so the ability to pay is, is critical. Another uh, bucket is the collateral. Right? So if we're making a loan to you um, and there's a default, right? we want to be able to dispose of the asset in some way to be able to get our money back. Right? It's not a grant, it's, it's, it's a loan. The third part is your willingness to pay. And that is a little tricky. That's where we need innovations. How do I know that if I make a loan to you, you're going to pay me back? In the U.S., for example, um, in mortgage finance, we use uh, what you call FICO scores. What's a FICO score? It's just a company that developed an algorithm right, uh, that looks at uh, you have credit repositories, credit bureaus. They look at your credit card behavior, you know, use of credit cards, and it gives you a score. Uh, the idea behind the score is that that score tells the lender whether this person, uh, how likely this person is to pay back my loan. Well, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we do not have that type of credit card usage. So we have to be innovative in how we address that credit risk. And there are companies out there, and we are actually deploying uh, um, that in our uh, uh, project. Um, there are alternative credit risk methods that I think are even better than those that I use in uh, Western uh, um, countries. Now, the two aspects of these alternative credit risk methods, one is psychometric testing, which there are ways to ask a quest questions to an individual, and you get a sense of their integrity. Um, and there are companies that have uh, used this, done this, and it's working pretty successfully. And the other part of the alternative credit risk methods that we're using is mobile phone data. There is a company um, called Tala, they are based uh, both in India, uh, in uh, Kenya, and also in the Philippines. And they are more in the microfinance space. But they developed an algorithm wherein the, uh, for example, a woman who wants to loan, say, $100, will download the app, and within a minute, they, they get a credit score. Their default rate is 80%, 92%. They raised $105 million. They started in 2012, and they did the last round of funding. They raised $105 million. Companies like TransUnion and some of the credit bureaus are now teaming up with these, and Tyler's not the only one. But my point is, and think about this, 
your mobile phone, your cell phone, tells more about you than your credit card usage using two of your credit cards. And so they look at the data and, you know, they have several thousand data points. So what, my point is that when we're looking at lending, we have to be innovative. We have to look at our society, we have to look at our community and figure out ways in which we can address the fundamental issues here, you know, but in ways that are fair to the, um, to the residents. So most people in Seattle have a cell phone that are in business. So why not use that in terms of the banking industry as ways to mitigate credit risk? So these are just some of the ideas that we're talking about and that we're looking at for um, our operations here uh, and to develop. So that's just my, uh, my two cents here. Thank you. Um, I thought uh, to address uh, Kweku's challenge in trying to be brief, I thought I'd actually turn my position into a question for Jima. Uh, you mentioned that IFC had uh, started sort of an alternative program to sort of fill in the gaps. And then as one of the metrics of success, you said that after X, year, X amount of time, I don't know, five years, whatever it was, that 50% of the companies were gone, and then 50% were still viable. And I'm just wondering, as you think about the metrics of success, how would you sort of define the metrics of success for this program and you know, knowing what you know now, would you do it again? Just to clarify, so 50% of the companies are not gone. Uh, we have 50% that are doing, over 50% that are doing extremely well. And the idea is because there's equity investment. The idea is at some point we will exit and a new shareholder will come in. So this over 50% companies are uh, up for financing at some point by an external shareholder. The other um, remaining um, um, companies are struggling and by, by struggling, I mean they need technical assistance, um, maybe refinancing, and, and, and a few that we just have to exit in at, at, at a loss. Now, how do we um, go forward? Um, I think uh, one of our challenges from the IFC end was probably to do with our fund manager. Um, and, um, and we've addressed this issue recently. Um, and, and so one way to measure the success of our investment is also to look at the fund manager. Make sure you have an efficient um, and, and present fund manager with the companies. Um, I, I think we've done, we did a good job in terms of our investments. Um, one of the criteria was to have a, someone on the board, a CEO or so, on the board of each business that we invested in. So that was a way of mitigating risk. And, and, and ensuring that we, um, our investments are, are sort of you know, safe. Um, I wouldn't say um, what, what we did in terms of the West African Venture Fund, we would need to reinvent the wheel if we were to fundraise um, for a, a, a larger fund or to invest in other uh, SMEs. Um, but our main issue um, was our fund manager and not the actual uh, methods we took in managing the Thank you, panelists. Before I throw, um, throw uh, the discussion open to the floor, I just wanted to, I think what we've got from here, from the uh, last bits of, of uh, remarks, first of all, we seem to have concentrated a lot on debt financing, on uh, loans, and especially in this new uh, context, on banks. Well, that's, that's a limit of my experience locally, so it's probably not surprising, but there are also, there can be opportunities for equity financing. Um, sometimes I often wonder why, um, maybe because I'm not a business person myself, not yet, why business people do not come together, to, especially in the same industry, in the same sector. Um, is that right? It's a real thing. Uh, not come together, bring your investments that you have together to form a company. Um, and come together. Maybe it's easier said than done, but I, I tend to not see that happening too often uh, in Sierra Leone. Um, so there still seems to be a bit of a, a gap, obviously, in terms of the financiers and the businesses uh, meeting. And um, 
just one thing I want to say. In my, my background is banking and microfinance. But in microfinance, we usually say that there are no bad borrowers, there are only bad loans. And who makes the loans? It's a lender. So it's the financier, it's the, the, the um, it, it's up to the financier to learn its end to ensure that you have a good borrower. But anyway, thank you to the panel for now. There will be questions and comments coming from uh, the audience, which I'm sure you need to respond to. Um, I have two questions for IFC, and I emphasize that for IFC and not for GMA, so don't take them personally. Excuse me, sorry. Can you just say who you are before when you ask? Uluni European Co-Current, uh, Council Member Servion, Chamber of Commerce Industry and Agriculture. IFC, um, was that a venture fund came about because of an assessment that was done around about 2008 to look at risk capital? You're now talking about um, the fragile state facility and an evaluation. Clearly, there is a, a gap when it comes to agricultural finance. Our commercial banks aren't equipped, as Ram said. They don't have the technical competence. Just come back from Nigeria, where they actually have a bank of agriculture. How can IFC use its tremendous resources to partner with the government and the private sector to put in place real agricultural financing? Secondly, um, you had a program in Liberia with the rubber sector, where you were able to work and um, put money into smallholders, etc., etc. It will be helpful for people here to understand how that worked and what are the barriers to making something like that happen here in Sierra Leone. Second question, quickly for um, Mr. Shabaka. Uh, there, you talked about the um, algorithms. My rudimentary understanding of algorithms is that to, for, fundamentally they're based on behavioral patterns. To what extent can we say that behavioral patterns in Asia are different from behavioral patterns here in somewhere like Sierra Leone? And how do you tweak those algorithms to make them useful as alternative credit mechanisms? Uh, initially, I guess, when some of them started by just making loans to people in general without asking questions. And as they were getting the data, they were able to tweak their algorithms. But this um, use of mobile phone data is uh, quite prevalent in East Africa, as I say in, in Kenya. And I'm not too sure. I think some have started, some companies have started also in, in Ghana. You have companies like Tala, Lendo, uh, Branch, and they have proven to be quite successful. And the, the, the bottom line is, when dealing with willingness to pay, you're looking at behavior. You're looking at behavior. So the, the algorithm rhythms are tweaked in a certain way in which um, they, they are able to determine how. Let me give you a typical example with the cell phone data. In, in Africa, we talk about our phones. So let's say we have two different uh, borrowers. One keeps their top up regular. The other one keeps running out of top up. Right? So the way it works is it will look at the person who maintains their phone charge as a better credit risk than somebody else. And that's just one data point. So they look at thousands of data points. Somebody who makes most of their calls at the most expensive, the peak hours, while somebody else uh, makes their calls in the, in the cheaper hours, for example. Um, it does say something about your behavior as to when you choose to make your phone calls. So these are the type of data points that they look at. And they're more reflective of your behavior as an individual and your willingness to you know, uh, pay an obligation than um, using a couple of credit cards here and there. And keep in mind, the Western system, where it's based on credit card usage, which is really not a true reflection of your character. So, uh, but this is it's penetrating in Africa, and uh, it's, it, it's being used and tweaked. Even with the psychometric testing that I mentioned before, from the EFL, they developed an African model, actually, that is working in, in Southern Africa. So it, it can be worked. The behaviors are different, I agree. Uh, but again, the algorithms can be tweaked, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just before Jima responds to Boronia's question, after Jima responds, uh, responds, we will take the questions in clusters, maybe three at a time. So Jima, if you can give a brief response, 
I'll, I'll be brief. Um, with regards to the question about what IFC, um, how IFC is working with the government and private sector now to address financing for agribusiness, that will be the local currency facility. Uh, we have full support of the Ministry of Finance and the Minister, and we have um, support from the Bank of Syria. The assessment is ongoing, it started in August, uh, to be completed next month. It will give us IFC Syria options to what we could do in terms of establishing a local currency facility here in Syria. And it's primarily um, for the agri agribusiness sector. Uh, because we have agri, agri business as a focus um, for strategy and it's also a focus um, for the government. And second, on the rubber facility in Liberia. Now, this is simple. Um, Syria has a, a barrier to, uh, one of the barrier, a barrier. Uh, there's a ban on FX lending in Syria. Um, Liberia is a dual currency country. So um, the IFC facility um, was in as usual, the dollar, dollar um, uh, denomination, and you could do so in Liberia. Um, and that's another example to how Syria missed out or misses out on opportunities from IFC would be the post Ebola um, um, facility, uh, which Liberia, the banks in Liberia were able to tap into, but our central bank was reluctant to um, to to um, access in Syria, and so commercial banks who had the opportunity to use um, this facility couldn't access it because of the ethics ban in Syria. Thank you, Jibba. You know, I have 415 people behind me, and most of them are here today as small businesses. And one of the concerns they've showed is when you talk of interest loans, I have not had the difference between what IFC is offering as compared to the normal banks. The reason for that is if you charge 30% to the normal banks, but uh, probably part of that percent, you pay what you call 2% processing fee. One of our business members wanted 1.5 billion Leon's loan, and he was going to pay 2% to process that loan, which is equivalent to 30 million Leon's. And the question I asked was, who are they processing? Now, uh, the second thing to get is uh, IFC was working on something like capital financing. The capital financing gives business options, especially those who are capital intensive, to scale up. But one of the recommendations I made during that time was, and I want to know if that has been followed up, when you do capital financing, you have to ensure uh, capital or the equipment you are financing. And that insurance adds another cost to the business person. So I would like to know what has been done in that regard to make sure that whatever interest on insurance is added does not exceed the market rate. The third one is most financial institutions do not give financial education to our business people. They are very much concerned about what they can achieve within a very short period. And whereas there are a lot of education you can pass on to these business people to make alternative choices for the best use of businesses. Thank you. Um, IFC. You said you people have a uh, West African venture to handle issues with low SMEs. But most people that have entered into that business exited because the conditions are too stringent. Two, you have been having rapport with the small SMEs all the time, and we have not seen anything. I am now asking, why don't you do it? Organizations like Slick and Sierra Chamber for Agri Business Development that deals on agri business. Work with them and see how you can improve your loan facilities to farmers. Thank you. So first of all, uh, in terms of barriers to investment, um, the key thing to remember is that the investor is doing this for one key reason, which is to make money. So, it has to be clear 
how the investment is going to make money. Before we make an investment, one of the questions we'd like to ask our entrepreneur is how are we going to make money from you? Okay, we don't hear a good answer. Typically, we don't invest. Okay? So, and as I said, the metrics of investment for us typically are a return on invested capital and we want to make a multiple and then the time frame associated with it. And we have a time window. And if the return is outside that time window, we're probably not going to invest. I think that there are other factors as well, which is how do you make a return? Now, typically in more developed markets, they make it a return by exiting the company in some way. So you essentially sell the company. You're either selling the company on the public markets through an IPO, or you're selling on the private market through some kind of M&A transaction. And that gives the investors and the management team a return. You can also sell to the management team itself through some management buyout. And so the management eventually assumes full control of the company and they pay out their investors. But these are ways that the investors can get their money. A lot of times, investments don't happen because people can't see clearly how they're going to make a return. So I think that's another key thing. Um, in terms of getting companies to be investment ready, so the number of key factors there. First of all, I should say, we are equity investors. So we do not invest in debt. We invest in straight equity, some kind of hybrid equity linked product, something like convertible debt. So we will invest in a debt instrument, but it's going to be a convertible instrument, which over time, with certain triggers, it's going to convert into equity. We're not interested in debt, primarily because you know, with the timelines, the return levels, etc. So we're very specific on how we invest and what we're looking for. I think that exit conflicts I mentioned, deal structures is another. You know, particularly in these sort of immature environments, a lot of times you're thinking about ways to dividend the out returns. So in other words, something tied to the revenue or the profit of the company and having a dividend connected to that. But for that you need financial transparency. You need a clear sense of what the financial situation of the company is. You need good financial reporting. You know, I've seen a lot of companies with multiple books. One book for the tax man and another book for the Okay? All that nonsense cannot continue. Okay? And so these are some of the key challenges. Now, in terms of, I'll take one last point, then I'll hand it over to Gina. So, what we do, as I said, is we are equity investors, which means we're there for the long term. And our job is not just to write a check to the company that's hands off. Instead, we're very active. We take seats on the board of directors. We provide strategic advice and coaching. If the company needs debt, we'll help to facilitate that. We'll make introductions. You know, we will help in terms of recruiting new people to the company. So we really sort of want to be the CEO's right-hand guy to really help the company. Because if the company isn't successful, then we're not successful. So as part of that, we do provide instructions, if needed, to a, uh, a company that we're investing in. Um, we provide some kind of shared services uh, around legal help, uh, financial assistance, uh, reporting structures, controls, etc. And so we really help to strengthen the company appropriately so it can grow. And so I think the idea of sort of education around financial uh, matters, I think, is a key aspect of what we would try to do in investment. But let me stop there and have a look at you. And so the first question was about what are the factors we look at. Um, I would say. Um, I would say we look at bankable projects, so the project needs to have a collateral, um, future cash flow, positive cash flow, and of course a high probability of success. So this is very key um, to projects that we look at. We don't just um, look at the threshold and then throw it around. So currently we do have a lot of projects that we are considering in the pipeline that fall below the threshold but are bankable projects. And hence why we're, we're looking at establishing this facility because um, it's one way for IFC to do more than we, we currently are doing in Syria. Um, on the interest loan um, question, uh, I would say IFC's pricing, um, 
investments uh, are usually in, in dollar, dollar notes, and we base that on LIBOR and add the country premium and then the price, the, 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 the project pricing. And so the interest rate or the IFC pricing differs from country. Given that Sierra Leone is uh, considered a fragile state, um, given the project that we're looking at, it depends on the risk. All of these determine the price of the, the, the loan that you will receive. Um, on capital financing, um, I'm not aware of a capital financing program, but maybe what you meant is our capacity building to microfinance institutions who um, loan out, um, uh, who give out funds to businesses for capital um, purchase uh, purposes. And for these, um, I, would, I wouldn't say more on this, but I just know that IFC, we haven't done a capital financing program um, recently, or in recent years, but we've definitely done um, capacity building to, to companies or to microfinance institutions to do capital financing. Um, on the West Africa Venture Fund, um, similar to what Ralph just said, um, it's equity investment, um, so we have to be stringent. And these words were, if, if, you, uh, if you're not successful, we're not successful. Um, so having someone present and, and um, uh, hand-holding uh, is required to see the success of the, building, uh, of, of, of the business. And on the SMEs, we usually engage with SMEs on a technical assistance um, uh, basis. So it's not financing. SME engagement tends to follow the advisory uh, programs, not our investment programs. So usually, and we, we also um, face this daily when we engage with SMEs, usually you do capacity building and expect financing at the end. It's not always the case, uh, but what we do try to do is build the capacity to a point where they're ready for investment. And in some cases, not particularly in Syria, but in some cases we've actually worked with SMEs who would build to a certain point and IFC has actually gone forward to, done, uh, to, to, to do uh, investment with them. Um, currently we have some pipeline activities um, on both investment and, and, and um, advisory and we have a client who we're currently giving us advisory services to and who we know is a backable project and we intend to do investment with them. So it, it sometimes goes hand in hand but we, we, we do um, struggle with uh, the expectations of um, SMEs and um, we also, lastly to say, we, we work with the Chamber of Commerce. We have an MOU with them. We also have an MOU with um, Sleeper. And Sleeper, we don't have with Sleeper, so sorry. But Sleeper, we have an MOU with. And together with um, Sleeper, we actually hosted an investment forum um, sometime in October 2017, last year. And it was a uh, final season uh, forum of which we brought potential investors to Syria. And that has actually led to positive outcomes in terms of the, the uh, um, finance leasing products that have been introduced in Syria. Thank you, uh, Jima. I think we'll end there, but before we end, I just want to ask the panelists to give one um, example or one way they think um, investment in agribusiness can be improved um, in Sierra Leone. That's one without uh, expanding on it. Starting from Eva, uh, please. Um, before I answer that, I'll just want to make one clarification quick. Um, the um, funds we got from West Africa Venture Fund was a toilet equity. Um, in my case, it was uh, about 55% equity and, four, and the rest was preference. And for that preference, the interest rate was Fifteen um, percent, and um, and for for my colleagues SMEs who don't understand what I'm talking about, with so equity, the investor is just is looking for dividends. So if you if you your business is profitable, they get dividends. If it isn't, they don't. But with the preference, their fifteen percent has to be paid. Um, so this is where I have a problem. Um, I think the 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 um, share in the in the in the funding must be more towards the equity, so it gives us the SMEs a little bit of leeway because most of the time um, um, you get you know you meet 
I don't want to say hassled because they want their money back. But um, you're being told the preference, you have to pay the preference, you have to pay the preference. And TAs, when you give TAs, that's the other thing. TAs are to be given for technical, I mean the TA is a technical assistance. You don't offer TAs to pay salaries as was being done, for example, during Ebola. Because I believe that as a business, you should be able to pay your staff. You know, so you're there to make money, not to give free money. And a lot of that free money was taken and now some folks can't pay back. Um, yeah, so the question was how we can positive, improve one particular area to positive improve like financing in agriculture. Um, just before saying that, I'd like to say that I do feel that financing of agriculture and other elements related to the sector are being considered, deliberated, and improved upon recently, and with plans to do so in the future. But one area where I feel there should be additional focus is in terms of the financial services aspect uh, from the banks. Now, that I, by that I mean two or three different aspects. One, they need to have the technical expertise to understand their clientele and how to maximize the value of their clientele and support them. Uh, that, by that, I mean providing services or products that are tailored to the agricultural sector. Factoring, for example, where you can purchase someone's accounts receivable. Basically, it's like the futures. Obviously, you're buying someone's goods before he's produced them. That allows him to inject the working capital into his company to grow gradually. Um, other aspects, like leasing, like debentures, like um, tribal, or regional issues in the particular area where he's in. So holistically, I'd say the financial services do need to improve with the support of the enabling environment to give them the confidence to do so. Thank you, um, So just to, to conclude, I would say, I mean, this forum is a, a Syrian ag agribusiness or diaspora um, focus forum. However, we haven't discussed how the diaspora can contribute to financing agribusiness. Um, so what I would like to um, um, end with is probably just the teaser, maybe to have the diaspora and the um, returnees and, and diasporas out there to probably start thinking about um, diaspora bond. Now, what we're doing, uh, our assessment has the potential to develop the local um, domestic capital market. And um, with that, you can introduce the diaspora bond. Now, remittance inflow in, in general tends to be far, tends to exceed um, um, allocations from from international development assistance. Um, in Syria, for instance, in 2013, the data is not really up to date. So, in 2013, we had 70 million dollars um, inflow of remittance um, to Syria, compared to 40 million from um, development assistance. So, it's something for us to think about. Um, and I think remittance in general we've seen in countries like Israel, Nigeria, and of course Rwanda, where we've seen remittance flow significantly um, um, impact the national development. Uh, remittance flow can be very impactful for agribusinesses. And I think in general we should start maybe thinking ahead. Uh, we don't have a functional capital market at the moment, but it's good to start thinking about that now. And and also it would be good to hear back what the appetite is for the diaspora bond from the diaspora. And um, from Dr. Roberts, um, with regards to her query, uh, we do have now a new fund manager, I'm sure um, if you're also aware of that, it's something we can take up with her, um, with your concerns. Thank you, Ima. Uh, yeah. uh, I think that uh, agribusiness finance must be separated from regular finance because of the, the unique nature. I think banks and lending institutions uh, must separate agribusiness uh, finance so that they can create more innovative products. As uh, uh, Ram was saying, for example, if your collateral is uh, the inventory, that inventory is perishable. So if there's a default, the lender may still not <laughs> get anything. The food may be rotten. So, um, I think agribusiness financing uh, should be considered separate. I don't think it should be placed with regular financing and treat that uh, customer the same way as somebody who's coming for a car loan or a mortgage or other type of financing. So I think that, uh, that that's an important distinction. Thank you.
Um, so I'll make two, briefly two quick points. One is uh, around uh, the diaspora angle and what the diaspora could do. I think Gino made a good point about the diaspora bond participation. Uh, I think another way to think about things uh, in terms of investment is diaspora pooling funds uh, and becoming uh, investors in a venture fund. So taking a limited profit position in a venture fund which can make investments. Uh, as I said, one of the key criteria that a lot of uh, uh, fund investors are looking for is local money. And I think uh, diasporas, uh, 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 individuals and families are certainly willing to uh, put their money to work uh, in their local regions, uh, but perhaps doing it through a more formal approach in a fund, uh, I think is one key way to go. And that's a fund that's focused on equity investments. I think the second point I'd make is just for all of the entrepreneurs and agripreneurs out there, which is when you're talking to an investor, think about what the investor is thinking about. Put yourself in their shoes, because I think that will make the conversation go a lot easier. And typically the investor is thinking about two things. One is how can they minimize risk? And two is how are they going to get a return? You need to figure out how to answer those questions, because that's what the investor is thinking. And if you don't answer them, they're going to come up with their own conclusion. There needs to be availability of equity, uh, equity financing, especially uh, for the business in Sierra Leone. We need product development. If there's not a world size at all. Um, we need agricultural specific financial uh, um, products and instruments. And not just for very large companies, but even for the smaller operators. I think that's one of the issues we have. Even my project, I get a lot of complaints, and it's especially because of the um, matching farm element, that small uh, agribusinesses don't benefit. So we need to ensure that we don't think only of large businesses, but also the smaller businesses. And of course, I think a good point that a good point that Ram made is the enabling environment. We need to be touched on like the legal system, especially and stuff like that. But anyway, thank you very much, panelists. And we have a very big hand for panelists.